because nobody knows more about lesbian scissoring than men with d I love this place! I think it's safe to say that the tabletop role-playing game industry has been completely infested with sociopathic narcissists. These people have managed to downplay and push aside the traditional RPG fan base from the mainstream with comparative ease. In the process, they've essentially made an entirely different species of gamer. It's hard for people who played from the early 80s onward, like myself, to recognize what some people consider role-playing these days. From the over-the-top acting and GMing to literally every player at the table wanting to be a furry of some kind. I mean, where are the straight human fighters these days? Where are the Cheetos and Mountain Dew, for that matter? Where are the Cheetos? They're right next to you. I cast a spell. Where's the Mountain Dew? In the fridge, duh. Where have all the cowboys gone? Many of these nouveau gamers are right now much more prone to want flavor of the day, left-leaning politics as part of the gaming experience. Whether it's representation by furry or the introduction of things like the absurd combat wheelchair, RPGs must now make a socio-political statement as well as being entertainment to attract this new market. The problem is that those two things socio-political statements and entertainment are pretty much at odds. Some of the games catering to these folks have become nothing more than North Korean Juche propaganda comics. There's a fantastic essay I'll link to below about the death of geek subcultures. It's called Geeks, Mops, and Sociopaths. It details the life cycle, perhaps inevitable, of cool things created by nerdy minds, which begets communities which grow and attract normies. That's when it becomes mainstream. Think D&D and its relationship with Stranger Things here. But eventually, when it gets big enough, the sociopaths show up. And they are the harbingers of death for any subculture. They tear through it like Lizzo at a Golden Corral buffet bar, destroying everything as they suck out every last dollar they can. Like comics, tabletop RPGs are a great case study for this. I believe we're somewhere in the beginning final stages. The invasion is in full force. The original geeks have been pushed aside and the normies are getting fleeced with pale imitations of what brought them to the scene in the first place. I've detailed the major companies of the industry, Wizards of the Coast, Paizo, Cobalt Press, and some of the people that they employ people who despise their traditional customer base of white men, even though a fair percentage of those men probably share similar political thoughts as they do. But even those companies are not quite 100% evil, <laughs> at least not yet. There is one company, however, that flouts its commie bona fides like a badge of honor. It's Evil Hat Productions. Now, they were known for a long time for their fate system, which had funny dice with pluses and minuses in it, if you've ever seen those. Um, and that powered games like Spirit of the Century, Fate of Cthulhu, The Dresden Files. Like so many companies, they were probably liberal all along, but didn't really shove anything in your face as a company too aggressively before the mid-2010s. And unfortunately, they went crazy along with the rest of the world. And now they make no bones about where they stand. Fascists need not play their games. Fascists for them, of course, being anyone to the right of, say, Bill Clinton. But in the last few years, in coordination with, or because of, their new Marxist mission statement, the quality of their games has been slipping. Chief among them is Thirsty Sword Lesbians, written by a trans-identified woman who is also, surprise, a lesbian. Because nobody knows more about lesbian scissoring than men with d Now, it's one thing to embarrass yourself by throwing your own stinky intellectual property up all over your shoes. It's quite another to defile a beloved character recognized by much of the Western world. Recently, Evil Hat was awarded the license to make a Tomb Raider tabletop role-playing game, featuring, of course, the one and only Lara Croft. Crystal Dynamics currently owns the property, Obviously, the flagship products here being video games. But if you had any hope that future video games in the line will be free from any woke idiocy, well, just look who they gave their tabletop rights to. 
I wouldn't hold out much hope here. This game will be called Tomb Raider Shadows of Truth. The cover features Lara, a chubby black amputee queen, two angry white chicks, Bartolo Colon's fatter younger brother, and nary a white dude in sight. In other words, Evil Hat's ideal game table. Remember, it's a feature, not a bug people. Now, if you had any hope of playing an exciting, traditional pulp adventure where you dare the jungle, avoid dangerous traps, and fight deadly guardians to win a legendary artifact, well, you obviously think it's 2005. No, sir. According to an early snippet in this game, you're going to be an anti-colonialist who works to reclaim raider culture. Good luck with that. <laughs> Someone who stops the liberating of artifacts from people who, well, obviously don't care enough to do it themselves. Or when they do, are just as likely to take a sledgehammer to them. I guess you can't appropriate what's been smashed to pieces. That's probably called a partial success in this game. The hilarious thing here is, when it's applied to Lara Croft, or any other white character who's playing in it, it becomes nothing more than classic white savior syndrome. That's why this genre falls apart completely when you take it out of the realm of the lone treasure hunter seeking fortune and glory. But naturally, Evil Hat is too up their own ass to recognize this. They'd have no problem turning Lara into a nagging suburban Karen who has to do the heavy lifting for the poor brown people. This is, of course, not a problem with the folks at Evil Hat. Leftist white women are the frontline soldiers in their dumb cultural vandalism that they're proud to be part of. In addition to reforming raider culture, they also want your character to raise awareness of peers, whatever the hell that means. I guess nothing says pulse-pounding action more than delivering a speech on archaeological diversity at the Chicago Airport Marriott. Like so much of what's vomited out of the left, this is just the policing of thought, demonstrated absurdly at the end of the released snippet. Here they expressly tell you the kind of game you have to run, saying you must address colonialist themes and respect the people and the cultures you encounter. In a modern setting, that might include ISIS, right? I suppose your characters will just have to nod sagely when Mohammed invites you to the acid-throwing hoedown on those uppity women who just want a higher education. Hey, don't judge, you colonialist pig. This game will use the lazy, powered-by-the-apocalypse system. It's a system that has its place, but also makes it easy for writers who don't have time for mechanics and just want to shoehorn into the games their own wacky agendas. It was used in Thirsty Sword Lesbians, here in the Tomb Raider RPG, and also in the just-announced God Killer RPG from none other than Connie Chang. Now, I've given more than my share of flack to Connie in the past, she actually helped kickstart my channel with her lunacy. Hell, she's immortalized in the intro to every one of my live streams. But I can say that on first glance, Connie's game looks far more interesting here than the Tomb Raider game. At least you seem to get to kill things in her game instead of time, which is pretty much the only thing you're going to be killing in the Tomb Raider RPG by Evil Hat. I think this game is going to be utter crap. They've already told you so. Nobody wants to watch a movie or play a video game where the heroes do this type of nagging, condescending, boring crap. Nobody's going to want to do it in an RPG either. Now, that doesn't mean that the game won't do well. Like Thirsty Sword Lesbians, people will buy it as a statement, put it on their shelf, and never touch it again. I suppose that is their right, but it's not going to have any long-term impact. But it'll make enough that Evil Hat will have the money to continue putting out games like this that nobody will play in any significant numbers. So the wheel keeps turning. The tabletop RPG industry continues its slow march into oblivion. As games from companies like Evil Hat spam the market, little bits of it die. Sociopaths who aren't interested in making fun games, but rather personal political manifestos to sell to their audience of, now, committed Marxists. They will continue to feast off of this dying body, not realizing, or perhaps just not caring, that they're making themselves obsolete in the process. There will come a time when not even their hardcores will buy these types of game books. It's inevitable for games where your character can't die and you're just there to fulfill the political fantasies of its narcissistic creators. Maybe when they leave the room, those of us who know what tabletop gaming is supposed to be, 
and come back and pass it on to the heirs who truly deserve it. Gatekeep your hobbies, people, or sociopaths like Evil Hat will seek to destroy it. Well, that's all for now. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you, good or bad. If you're subscribed to this channel, just check and make sure, would you? I've had a few people tell me that they thought or knew they were subscribed, and surprise, <laughs> they weren't. While I'm not alleging anything, uh, why not check just to make sure? And remember to join us every Wednesday for The Lair. That's our weekly live stream. Me and a couple of my friends go over news of the day, talk to interesting people, wisecrack, even do a little live play. Always a great time, and we'd love to see you there. Well, that's all for now. I hope you guys have a great, great rest of your day. And uh, until we talk again, goodbye. <laughs>